Welcome to this Facebook Live event. We're coming to you from the Barnes Jewish Hospital Cardiac Catheterization Lab. I'm your host, Angie Weidinger, and this is Dr. Mitch Faddis. He is with the Washington University Barnes Jewish Heart and Vascular Center. And we are in a room that I would not normally be in unless I was having some kind of procedure done, which is really exciting for me to get to see all of this innovative technology that we're surrounded by, and that's what we're going to get to talk about today. Actually, to even come into this room, we had to, I had to don some special gear, some special wear that's very comfortable, I might add. <laughs> but to come into this room, we had to wear this, and we're going to talk about this technology in a way that hopefully many of you will be able to understand. Where our goal is to keep it interesting um, and simple so that people like me not in the medical profession can understand. So, Dr. Faddis, you are an electrophysiologist which I had never really even heard that before. What, what does an electrophysiologist do? Uh, well, um, thanks, Angie. This, an electrophysiologist is a cardiologist okay. who specializes in the electrical system of the heart. And as we were speaking about recently. Right, I wouldn't even normally think about the heart in an electrical way. Yeah, yeah well, that's a, an important concept because the, the heart is a pump. Most of us know that it pumps blood. Right. But that pumping action is stimulated by a natural pacemaker that generates an electrical signal that flows from the top to the bottom of the heart. In the wake of that, the mechanical action of the heart happens. Okay. And the heart relaxes and waits for another electrical signal. Now, the rhythm problems that I see, the electrical problems that I see, have to do with um, a disruption of that natural rhythm. Um, and atrial fibrillation, which is what we're going to focus on today and talk about, is the most common electrical problem that people have. And it involves a the top part of the heart that's generally continuous. And what happens with that is the mechanical action of the top part of the heart is disrupted. And the bottom chamber is um, set in motion at a much higher and irregular rate. So combination of those two, the lack of efficiency of the pumping action and the increase in the rate results in symptoms and things like shortness of breath or fatigue, even chest pain, lightheadedness, um, just an overall inability to do things are common symptoms for, for people with AFib, really demoralizing and disabling. Um, people often, we were talking about, sometimes get depressed because they can't do the things that they normally could do, right? Exactly. Like a game of golf would completely take it out of you. That's a, that's a very good point. A lot of the, the treatments focused on AFib um, are for people that are the most symptomatic. And I, I think um, the, the way it's disrupted their quality of life, the, the things they want to do but can't do, keeping right. up with grandkids or children um, are common complaints that I, that I hear. So what are some of the treatments that, that people can have for atrial fibrillation? Well, the most important and the one that I think a lot of people are aware of is um, blood thinners. And in general, AFib, atrial fibrillation accounts for probably um, as much as uh, one in three of the strokes that happen. Um, and our best way to protect people against strokes is to use a blood thinner. Okay, um, which has its own side effects, right? It has right? its own side effects. Now, the, um, the impact of other treatments aimed at the AFib on stroke is really uncertain at this point. And so, by far and away, the most important treatment in patients with AFib um, who are indicated for a blood thinner is to take that blood thinner. Now, some people can get away with an aspirin or can't tolerate a blood thinner, and an aspirin may even be too much in that group. So that's where um, there's opportunity for new technologies to, to help with. Um, but the focus that we're going to talk about today is actually in preventing AFib or getting rid of the AFib. And there's a host of treatments that go along that, that line. So let's talk about that. Some okay. exciting technology that we're kind of surrounded by. What, what, what is kind of innovative in this arena? Well, this is a, a, a great room to do the, this session in because it, it shows some of the um, equipment that's important for us to be able to see the inside of the heart and to use that information to guide um, a, treat, a specific treatment called catheter ablation. Uh, and it's fair to say that's a minimally invasive, but not um, completely non-invasive, but a minimally invasive treatment where we try to disrupt that electrical chaos that's going on in the upper parts of the heart. Okay, and so 
how, how, what, what then happens? How are you disrupting this electrical chaos? Well, the, um, the, the main um, principle of, of the treatment in the last 10 years anyway has been to create a boundary, like a fence, around the most active parts of the heart that generate the atrial fibrillation. Okay. And we call that pulmonary vein isolation. And that remains um, the most important piece of the catheter ablation technique. Um, but unfortunately, that has not proven to be terribly effective at dealing with the majority of people who have atrial fibrillation that's continuous. And in that group, um, we've looked at a variety of different approaches, but the most promising one, the one we're gonna talk about today, is to actually try to map the patterns of the electrical activity as they exist in the atrial fibrillation and to see within that little tornadoes, little hurricanes, since we're in hurricane season, right. of, of atrial fibrillation. And it turns out those little hurricanes are positioned in particular areas. If we can spot them with the mapping system and that ablation or burning on the inside of the heart in those zones will be able to get rid of the atrial fibrillation. And that's, so you're referring to this rotor mapping, is that what it's that's called? That's right. And that's what we're seeing here on the screen, right? Yeah. Tell me a, about, yeah, what are we seeing here? It's a great example. Um, so this, this map that I, that I have here is generated in a patient with atrial fibrillation. And we've positioned a mapping catheter, which is a, a basket. So this is this basket that we're seeing right here. Uh-huh. How is that? That's in the heart. In the inside of the heart. How does that, how are you getting that inside the heart? We pass it through essentially a soda straw like structure called a sheath and once outside of that sheath it inflates like a balloon but you haven't opened up this is not a surgery it's not you didn't have to that's open right. up the chest or anything this came through the groin you can that's pass right. it up we can go through that's an incredible. IV in the leg and then reach the right place in the heart and then as that expands and makes contact we get access to the electrical activity we can see that and with this um, mm -hmm. high-powered computer and the software, we're able to display that electrical uh, information in uh, a pattern that we can see and analyze. And what we've done here is, with the help of the software, highlighted a particular area of the inside of the left atrium where there is rotational activity, these little red spots. It's like a weather map. You mentioned It looks that. just, to me, when, when you first show this, Emma, what are, what, are, what are we looking at here? Yeah. The colors help out tremendously, but it looks like a weather map where the activity, obviously the red, indicates a lot of activity, right? That's right. So the, um, the it, white, the areas really that are sequentially white are the, the front mm -hmm. of a wave front, like a wave of electrical activity and the computer is highlighting here a particular area where those wave fronts are just spinning around repetitively and that is a rotor right here so this is what we would call the core of a rotor and that would be a target for catheter ablation so basically when you see something like that what is what's happening there that's causing problems that's the explain what that electrical what's happening there <laughs> Well, that's a great question, and, and it's fair to say we don't have a great understanding of why particular areas um, are home to these uh, rotors, because you would think if you spin a top yeah. and turn it loose on a desktop, it tends to just sort of wander around and yeah. go wherever it wants. Well, these rotors don't do that. They tend to sort of position themselves in particular areas, and we think that's because of potentially a little piece of scar that sort of tethers the rotor to the edge of the scar. Oh, or interesting. That the, the electrical characteristics of that area of the heart are such that um, rapid electrical activity is supported, where other areas may not be able to support rapid electrical activity. So that's why, then you know specifically where to go, and then what do you do then? Once you, once you identify uh -huh. that this is where all this activity is happening, then what, then what happens? Well, um, as, you, as you're pointing out here, a big part of the procedure is to map the lay of the land and to see what's active and what's uh -huh. important. And once we've found out where on the inside of the heart the hot spot is, uh, we move the ablation catheter to that place and actually sequentially burn all of these areas wow. to try to get rid of the electrical properties of that area. And it'll, the places that we've ablated will form a scar that hopefully isn't electrically active in the future. Um, but then we map again to make sure that the, that rotor activity, those little hurricanes, are no longer there. And in the best case, 
uh, while ablating uh, the rotor, we can see atrial fibrillation just collapse and go away. Wow. So interesting. You are, we're showing you footage of this is actually a procedure that's taking place. You, you said you do about how many of these in a year? About 250. About 250. And this is a procedure that, like you said, the mapping and then the ablation, that it, it takes quite a bit of time, doesn't it? It does. Uh, the, uh, if we include the rotor mapping, uh, it does generate a longer procedure, but we hope uh, more effective. And certainly that's been our experience with it. Uh, that for persistent or continuous atrial fibrillation, the outcomes are better if we add this rotor mapping together with the uh, pulmonary vein isolation. So, so uh, that on the, uh, the, the screen that's showing the procedure, you're actually seeing an area where rotor mapping has been carried out, and that little black circle is the an area like where these red spots are where okay. the rotor is. So, like you said, so generally speaking, when you go in, it's not just a one spot. We're not seeing one of those little rotor activity. You see several of those usually. Yeah, that's that's true. We um, we map both the right upper chamber and the left upper chamber, and we'll typically see something on the order of four in each patient. Really? Some more, some less. Uh, but we'll try to take care of each of those rotors individually, one at a time. Now, if you have questions out there, please comment, put those in the comments because we're here to answer, he is here to answer those for you and uh, we'll get to those. Such an interesting procedure. So when, once people have this done, is, is there any kind of side effect? I mean, for me, when I hear, oh my goodness, this ablation that's destroying parts of, not destroying, but changing parts of that heart, mm -hmm. it sounds a little scary, but yeah. it actually has amazing benefits, right? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a good point, and it's fair to say that we are creating a scar. So a the, scar. The, the thing that we're ablating, um, the heart muscle that we're ablating, um, has a very dramatic electrical impact on the function of the heart, uh -huh. and the mechanical impact that a very small, um, I wouldn't say microscopic, but certainly on the order of the head of a pencil, that much heart tissue um, isn't very meaningful in a mechanical sense, but electrically it can drive the entire show in terms of what's causing the AFib. So it is a trade-off, but I think it's a, it's a reasonable one. And like you said, this is something for someone who is active, and after this, we're, like you said, we're not opening up the, the chest, this is something that's minimally evasive. Are they getting back to their regular activity fairly soon after this happens? That's the goal, and I think uh, the experience with, uh, with it that I've seen in patients is that recovery is pretty quick. Um, most people feel fairly normal the next day. It's uh, certainly by a week out, I ask them to return to usual activity. So we hope that, that we're doing this to, uh, to allow them to, uh, to have a better quality of life, not to have symptoms that are limiting and, and they can get back to that as soon as possible. Now healing is another matter. And what we create with ablation is an injury to the heart. And what we want to come from that is a scar that's permanent and long lasting. And that transition from the injury to a healed heart that no longer will support AFib, that takes probably two to three months. Okay. Uh, so there is the healing phase and sure. um, the inflammation that goes with that. Sometimes AFib can happen while the healing is happening. That can be frustrating. Sort of describe that as a part of the package and probably a half of patients will have some AFib early on as it sputters along. But we hope yeah. for a long-term outcome. Yeah. The cure in the long term. So this is this rotor mapping, the rotation rotor, it took yeah. me a minute to figure that out. Yeah. But the rotor mapping, this is something that's generally new? Basically it is, new? It is new. It was developed, um, a scientist um, who actually did his training here, Sanjeev Narayan, came up with the idea and developed this um, particular version of, of the, a company that allows for the mapping. And it's now been used across uh, worldwide. And uh, it's fair to say that it's, uh, it's an important new part of uh, the treatment for AFib. Uh, and we haven't had a lot of major breakthroughs in the AFib realm for, I would say, the last five years anyway, small incremental yeah. developments, but I would view this as a revolutionary technique. Well, and when we talk about revolutionary techniques, this is Washington University, Barnes Jewish Hospital. This has been a place that a lot of those innovations have been made and refined, right? Because there's another procedure that was founded here. That's correct? right. Yeah, May surgery 
was developed by Jim Cox in, in the 80s and a team of scientists that worked with him, John Bueno in particular, who um, developed a surgical technique um, that allowed for curing atrial fibrillation by creating a series of surgical incisions uh, that were cut and then sewn in sequence. And the, the result of that was to divide up the upper chambers of the heart in a narrow corridor, a maze, where the electrical signal could get to where it needed to go, mm -hmm. but that the little eddies and swirls or tornadoes yeah. were, were not allowed to form because the corridor was too narrow. So, so that, is that kind of the, what has been, this is all built upon a, a bit? The some of, certainly the pulmonary vein isolation that we do is uh, from the maze, directly from the maze surgery, a set so of, of lesions. But the actual rotor mapping is different sure. from the maze. So that, uh, it may be why the maze is effective, that it basically does not allow for rotors to develop. Um, but I, I think that it's hard to minimize how important the, the work that led to the maze, because prior to that, um, most people did not think AFib was curable by anything, really, any technique. Cardioversions could be done, which is an electrical shock, and, and that does reset the, the rhythm in many people. Some people, even that doesn't work, but the AFib tends to come back, and that's the, the most important aspect to AFib. So the benefit of this rotor mapping, before, before you had the rotor mapping, was it how did you know where to go and do the cardiac ablation? ablation? How did you know where to go? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's fair to say that there have been a lot of ideas about how to do that. And mostly, they have not panned out very well. So early on, as in um, 17, 18 years ago, uh, trying to uh, ablate the things that were most active and to limit the ablation to that was done. Unfortunately, the recurrence rates were high because uh, it was like whack-a-mole. You might get one spot one day and then it's another spot nearby that pops up the next day. Right. Uh, so then the more regional technique developed and that's the pulmonary vein isolation. Um, but even that wasn't enough. And so uh, looking at individual electric electrical signals and trying mm -hmm. to make sense of what those look like since with a catheter we can really just record one or two or three or four at a time. That was used and techniques developed to to use that as a guide for ablation. The trouble is the, the heart's a big place and there's lots going on and so the panoramic or global mapping that's available to us from these basket catheters is just completely different from what we could get from a single catheter. And I think that's where the strength of the procedure is. So interesting. We have a question. Okay. They're asking, are blood thinning meds required after ablation? That's a great question. Uh, it's critical early on because we've created an injury on the inside of the heart and that injury will grow a scab just like a cut on your skin and could generate a clot that would cause a, a stroke. Now outside of the ablation and the healing, um, then we have to resort to other indications about whether or not a blood thinner is a good idea long term. And we look at things like um, how old, the older you are, the higher the risk of stroke. Um, if you have diabetes or hypertension, uh, if you have uh, coronary disease or vascular disease, if you've had a stroke before, all of those things contribute to a risk that's ongoing in spite of what we can do with catheter ablation. Mm -hmm. And we use those factors to judge whether or not you need a blood thinner long term. What, when we talk about cardiac ablation, what kind of success rate are we talking about? We can, with, um, with this technique right now, we're seeing about a 75% one year cure rate at, uh, in our series of patients that we've done here. We certainly do it a second time if uh, patients uh, don't have a great result and have more AFib. Um, and I think with uh, one or two procedures, we're in the range of 80% at a year off of, of drugs. And uh, it's, it's not as effective as maze surgery, but it's minimally invasive. It's certainly reasonable and a great technique for people that get a cure out of it. We, we have another question. If you're suffering from AFib or experiencing symptoms, what should you do? I think you should see a cardiologist in, at, uh, as a first step, just to make sure you're channeled into the right um, path to get the treatments that are available right now at the cutting edge. Certainly the blood thinner decision is an important one to make right off the bat. And I think any cardiologist 
the general would be uh, equipped to make that decision. Very good. And again, talk about some of the things that you would be experiencing. We talked about them earlier, but again, some of the things that you're experiencing that might be a good reason to go see a cardiologist. Well, um, the tip off for a lot of people is uh, a rapid irregular pulse. So they get the sense their heart is beating much too fast given mm -hmm. the activity. Uh, and then symptoms like shortness of breath or all of a sudden patients aren't able to do simple things like climbing stairs. Okay. Uh, or they had been exercising, but now it's hard for them to walk it's around It's just the taking block. it out of them. Yeah. Yeah, fatigue. Okay. Uh, it's usually not a mystery. Okay. People. Got another question. Would heart medications need to be taken post-procedure? I am currently on, <laughs> help me out. What's that, is that a medication I for AFib? I think it probably means Toprol or Metoprolol. Okay. Um, the AFib generally happens in the setting of other health problems. So hypertension or coronary disease okay. are two conditions where beta blockers like Toprol are really important. So. That drug is sort of killing two birds with one stone. It's aimed at the AFib, but also aimed at um, the other health problems too. So it's possible that you would still need to take Toprol for those other health conditions okay. um, after an ablation. What I find so incredible about all of this is this is something that you're not having to do surgery, that these are teeny tiny tools that you're able to send into the heart. It really is amazing, this technology. It has really, uh, been dramatic the evolution of the techniques and I think in in medicine and surgery in general to, to miniaturize the therapeutic things to use really innovative ways to look at tissues particularly the yeah. heart we have these electrical maps we also have anatomic maps we can get from CT and MRI and we we do that typically in every patient who goes through ablation and import that into a mapping system and then we also have a three-dimensional mapping technique that's like GPS, where the computer can tell where in three-dimensional space we're touching, and we use all of those different pieces of technology aimed at the ablation. And we have, we really appreciate all your questions, but we're gonna have this video living online, and please answer, ask more questions. We'll get someone to answer those for you. Also, there's a form. If you have questions about atrial fibrillation, you can fill out the form. We'll have a heart specialist get in touch with you, answer all your questions, so that's a great resource for you to use. There's so many things to talk about, so many different procedures and things that are done here, and more innovations, I'm sure, that's been being worked on, so. It's really an incredible field that, that you work in. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for helping us with all these questions that we had today, and it's been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you, Ed. For welcoming us in, we appreciate it, and keep asking those questions, and uh, we'll see you on our next Facebook Live event. Thanks for joining us.